Our next guest was at the center of the press's shifting role in American politics and culture. Gay Talese got his start as a copy boy and a sports reporter at the New York Times. He hustled his way into covering more serious stories, sending him to places like Selma during the 1965 protests, where Talese reported what he saw to a national audience, like marchers facing down the threat of violence. Quote, there were young blondes in polo coats and hipsters with beards. There were white faces and black faces, ministers' collars and turtleneck sweaters. They differed in age and religion, but shared a unity of purpose. They'd come to march through the streets of Selma. He wrote, a young man with a short blonde beard yelled at Dr. King, you son of a bitch, you want to vote? Why don't you act like a human being? Dr. King said nothing. What tomorrow? Nobody knew, end quote. Reflecting later on that reporting, Talese says he was dissatisfied with much of his writing, noting, I wish I could think of better words to describe what I had seen, even though, in a fully understood and enduring sense, I was not really sure what I had seen, beyond the sadism and suffering along the highway. But Talese felt that his independence from elites was an advantage. When I was a young journalist, we were of the underclass, and we would approach them as we were looking from the outside in to a world of privilege and power and affluence. Talese bore down on privilege and power. Who had it? Why? Who was trying to take it? He charted how television changed the culture and created new stars, writing, it was not that television was slanting the news, but that the newsmakers were slanting themselves to television. That shaped who the elites were and the language they spoke. Talese also had a knack for cutting through spin and PR. His iconic Esquire profile, Frank Sinatra, has a cold, is considered a masterpiece of new journalism because it revealed Sinatra's world through people around him, even though Talese had virtually no access for an interview with the star himself. Talese says the real story isn't always about the so-called big people. All these little stories are really big stories if you think big about little people. And that's what I like to do. I thought there were so many interesting people, not important people necessarily, not people who would make news, but people who were part of newsmaking, or at least part of the miracle of daily journalism. Gay Talese, the miracle of daily journalism, an honor to have you here. And for me to be here. Uh, you look at this era, what I wanted to do with the benefit of your presence was look at some of the different presidents, because you've seen so much. Take a look at Lyndon Johnson, uh, talking about the press and its role in those heightened times of Vietnam. Uh, we believe very strongly in preserving the right to differ in this country and the right to dissent. And if I have done a good job of anything since I've been president, is to ensure that there are plenty of dissenters. <laughs> and there's not a person in this press corps that can't write what he wants to write. And most of them do write what they want to write. What do you see there? I remember how strong the press, especially the New York Times that I knew best, was against Johnson in, the, in his war. David Halberstam, for example, who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1964 at the New York Times covering Vietnam, was loath within the White House of Johnson as well as his predecessor, John Kennedy. In fact, John Kennedy, in 1962, went to the published New York Times to try to get rid of, or 63, try to get rid of Halberstam, try to move him out of, out of him, uh, him. Saigon. Ousted, yeah. Ousted. And, and you know, the history of the presidency and the press is one of an adversarial relationship, if not a sense of loathing entirely. I mean, there's not a president that liked the press. Roosevelt hated the New York Times, Franklin Roosevelt. And, and Truman, you know, what he did with a, with a music critic that, that didn't like his daughter Margaret's way of singing. I mean, we're, we're, what we have now in, in the White House of Trump is, is not to be singled out as a special case of, of the president feeling he's being persecuted or trying to Point his, point, point his own uh, rancor on the press itself. It's an, old, it's an old story. An old story. So let me play some, some of uh, Donald Trump, some of this from when he was a candidate, um, personally singling out reporters, even making, um, making light or making fun of one's handicap. A nice reporter. Now the poor guy, you got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I, oh, maybe that's what I said. There's something happening. They're not reporting it, Katie. You're not reporting it, Katie. But there's something happening, Katie. 
Does it concern you or do you see it as really of a piece with the history? Well, it, it concerns me, but on the other hand, as a journalist, and I still am at 85, not as, as, as lissom as I was at 25, but still active in my own ambition as a journalism, as, journal, as a journalist. I see this president as representing what we loathe, but also I do believe that his, his persona, his face is a face of America that is real, but we just do not want to condone and shouldn't. Who is we? Donald Trump is America. It's not the America that, that we want to elevate or even appreciate, but there is much of him throughout this country. It's not something we wish to extol or appreciate or accept, but it's here. There are many, many Donald Trump faces in this country. He speaks to a constituency that is not the kind of people that you wish to associate with, you, me, anybody, but they, they, there really is an anger in this country and there's a sense of, of isolation in this country. You think the political establishment didn't want to believe that the support was out there for him? I believe that. I believe that and I believe that the journalists of, of your generation as opposed to mine which goes back 50 years, we were very different in my time as journalists compared to the ones today because we were much more aware of, of, of the low basic sometimes uh, despicable character of our country because many of us came out of a rough and tumble or down and out life. Me, we journalists of the post-World War II period, of which I'm a part, I started in 1953-54, we were of the underclass. We, right. were, we were of the class that in, two generations later will vote for right. Trump. You didn't identify you know I mean? exactly yeah. the same way that, that reporters can be so cozy. You talk about your craft. I was reading this. I want to read it to you. you. You said why you don't like to use a tape recorder in your writing. You said Recording an experience can prevent the insight that comes from deep probing. Mm -hmm. Reporters who use a recorder, instead of being in the moment, risk generating only a first draft drift of the mind, symptomatic of a society permeated by fast food, computerized, <laughs> bottom line, and personalized workmanship, reducing the once artful craft of writing to the level of talk radio on paper. I wonder what you think of a world where so many people go to a concert and they try to video record it so they don't actually watch it, they just watch it through the, the video and whether we're losing something tactile here. Yeah, I do think uh, as a senior, senior citizen of journalism that we are losing a lot. When I first was a young man of your age, I, I got a job in the old time reporter. When I first walked in the New York Times, my first day as a rookie, rookie reporter, he said, young man, stay off the telephone. The telephone in my time, 1950s, was the new technology. Hmm. You have to, he said, you have to show up, you have to see the be there. spaces, be there, yeah. be there, I don't care. Well, right now, in this, in the grand, the grandchildren, comparably, uh, people are just are looking at their their smartphone and the li the life is through the laptop, and there isn't that discovery by chance of wonderful characteristics of the story. Right. The, there is so much that's focused on on getting it fast, getting it first, not necessarily getting it all, but getting it to a degree right, right. but to a degree incomplete. Uh, listen, uh, keep hey, it up, but I, it's you. a hard work. You're doing hard work. <laughs> okay, Talise, thank, thank you. you. This is so wonderful. Thank I appreciate you. it. I hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.